If you ever get a chance, you should take a drive through the Alps from the French side and make your way to Italy. Of course, following Hannibal's path. Now, you could drive through several of the tunnels that have been carved through the mountains, but you will want to take the longer route to get an idea of what the Carthaginians had to go through. And to see it in person is rather incredible. The huge vertical drops are jaw-dropping. The mountains go straight up and straight down. They are very, very steep. And during the drive, ask yourself several times just how did Hannibal and his army ever make it through there, especially with elephants in tow. Well, as you know, it's one of the most celebrated achievements in military history. So if you are ever in France, I suggest you make the drive. The drive is absolutely beautiful, and you will get an idea of the hardships that the Carthaginians faced. Okay. Hannibal's exact route across the Alps has been the subject of a lot of debate. And in my opinion, it's really unnecessary, as historians have a pretty good idea of the route. As you can see here, there are six main suggested routes. This area marked in green is the route that Polybius seems to suggest. And that is the one we are going to focus on. I am not going to waste your time going through all of these different routes. I think the narrative about the struggle itself through the mountains is far more important. If you do want to read a great write-up on these different passes, I would suggest you read Peter Connolly's book, Hannibal and the Enemies of Rome. I don't think anyone has presented this better than Connolly. Okay, now you might have noticed that I have been drawing heavily off Polybius and to a lesser extent Livy. Both provide us with an account of Hannibal's crossing of the Alps. Livy seems to suggest a southerly route, while Polybius suggests a more northerly route. Both narratives are actually very similar. Both account for a 16-day trek across the Alps. In any event, I will do the same here as I've been doing throughout the Punic Wars. Polybius first, and Livy to fill in the gaps. Now, Polybius was born a few years after the end of the Second Punic War. Polybius himself actually retraced Hannibal's route and undoubtedly had a chance to speak to people that witnessed Hannibal's crossing. This is why much deference is given to Polybius. Okay, so we last left off with Hannibal giving Scipio the slip. Hannibal really had no intention of offering up battle to the Romans for a couple of reasons. The first was he really didn't want to wear out his army when they would need every ounce of their strength to cross the Alps. Also, his allied Gallic chieftains had urged him to make the crossing as soon as possible, as there were greener pastures in the Po that could provide for his army. And, of course, winter was fast approaching, so it was critical to make it through the Alps. There was already going to be enough snow up there, so the Carthaginians didn't need to deal with the heavier snowfalls, and that would have undoubtedly delayed Hannibal until the spring, which would have given Rome more time to prepare their defenses. Now, as I mentioned in the last video, by the time Scipio arrived on the scene, Hannibal was long gone. Scipio returned to the sea rather than chase Hannibal around the Alps. Scipio opted to send most of his army by sea to Spain. They would be led by his brother with orders to drive Hasdrubal right out of Spain. This act seems curious, since there was already an uprising going on in the Po, so it might have been more sensible for Scipio to move his entire army there since he would have to deal with that Gallic uprising, not to mention Hannibal making an eventual appearance. In Scipio's defense, he was following the Senate's orders to attack Spain. Scipio also might have reasoned he would have no problem recruiting new legions when he arrived back in Italy. In any event, after a four-day march from the Rhone, Hannibal approached an area that both Livy and Polybius referred to as the island. It was called the island because the Isera and Rhone rivers both enclosed a considerable extent of this land. You can see the Rhone right here, and here is the Isera. By the way, both of these rivers flowed down from different points in the Alps. This area was dominated by a Gallic tribe called the Allobroge. Hannibal arrived during a period of civil unrest, and these were situations just waiting to be exploited by Hannibal. Apparently, a civil war had broken out between two brothers who were competing for the throne. Hannibal likely would have paid little attention to this quarrel, but the elder brother, Brancus, offered grain and weapons in return for Hannibal's assistance. Hannibal accepted and resolved the dispute in favor of Brancus. Brancus kept his end of the bargain by supplying the Carthaginians with well-needed provisions. Hannibal immediately resumed his march and in 10 days reached the foot of the Alps. Livy indicates that the mere sight of the Alps struck terror in Hannibal's men. The huge vertical drops and height of the mountains sent shivers through his army. It was only Hannibal's constant speeches and sheer charisma that kept his army focused on the task at hand. 
At the foot of the Alps, Hannibal learned that several Gallic chieftains hostile to the Carthaginians had occupied critical positions along the route that Hannibal intended to take. Hannibal deemed it wise not to enter and made camp at the entrance to the pass. He dispatched scouts to ascertain what hidden dangers lay ahead. These scouts determined that the Gauls held the pass only during the day. At night, they would retire back to their village. Ancient chroniclers will often mention that barbarians did not operate at night. Well, who knows about that? But Hannibal was never opposed to after-dark maneuvers, and once the Gauls had departed, he simply had his men seize all the strategic positions in the pass. And with that, Hannibal gave the order for the long column of pack mules and horses to advance. According to Polybius, the road was very narrow and very steep. The slightest misstep caused animals and men to plunge right down the precipices. All the time, the Gauls were harassing every vulnerable point in the column, except apparently wherever the elephants were located. The appearance of these beasts put a supernatural type of fear in the tribesmen. Eventually, Hannibal ordered the men that had previously occupied the higher ground to attack the Gauls. Both sides suffered heavy casualties. After some doing, Hannibal was able to capture the enemy's fortified village. Here, he was able to confiscate much-needed grain. In this town, Hannibal finally gave his weary army a day's rest. Hannibal's capture of this town demoralized the Gauls, and so much so that the march for the next three days was rather uneventful. But all of that changed on the fourth day. A coalition of tribes approached Hannibal in peace. They promised not to impede his march and even offered to provide hostages. Hannibal was suspicious of their motives, but decided to accept their offer. Even if they reneged, Hannibal would gain supplies and at least some guides for the next few days. But not surprisingly, two days later, the tribes attacked Hannibal's column with a focus on the rear guard. The tribesmen waited for the opportune moment when the Carthaginians were passing an extremely deep and narrow ravine. But Hannibal, as I mentioned, had already been suspicious enough that he left his heavy infantry in the rear. The heavy infantry succeeded in repelling the main assault, though in the process they suffered considerable losses. Adding to the terror was the fact that the Gauls from above hurled rocks down at the Carthaginians. Still, there was no turning back, and the Carthaginians continued on with this remorseless ascent up the Alps. The next morning, the Gauls were nowhere to be found, and Hannibal was able to continue on with his march, largely unimpeded. Eight days later, the Carthaginians reached the summit of the Alps. Hannibal camped here for two days. This would give his army some much-needed rest. Polybius indicates that amazingly many stragglers, including horses and pack mules, rejoined the army. The morale of the army was quickly lowered with the first heavy falls of snow. With apparently a panoramic view of Italy, Hannibal reminded his army that the Po Valley awaited them, and that the descent would be much easier than the ascent. So with that, the next morning the army began its descent down the Alps. But the Carthaginians were in for a hideous shock, as it turned out the descent was far more treacherous and difficult than the ascent. The Italian side of the Alps is far steeper. Also, the Italian side was far icier, making it for appalling conditions. Many animals and troops slipped right down the icy cliffs, never to be seen again. Adding to the misery, a long stretch of the road had collapsed. Even worse, a thin veil of snow fell over the smooth ice. These conditions made it impossible to gain a secure footing. Hannibal decided it was wise to halt the march and fix the broken road. After three days and a lot of work, the road was repaired, which allowed the long columns to proceed down the steep Alps. Three days later, an exhausted Carthaginian army descended into the Po. Here they found nice, pleasant, sunny pastures and flowing rivers surrounded by woodlands. The animals were given time to graze, and even more importantly, the exhausted army was allowed to rest. Hannibal's army was down to 20,000 foot and 6,000 horse. These were staggering losses considering he had departed Iberia with 50,000 foot and 9,000 cavalry. And this doesn't even count the massive amount of horses and pack mules that were lost during the trek. But there was hope that Hannibal could rebuild his army with soldiers supplied from his latest Gallic allies in the Po. And of course there were the Romans to deal with. We will get to all of that in the next lecture.